How's it going, Hillside? My name's Corey, and I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Hillside. I get a chance to work in our young adults ministry. It's the greatest thing ever. Shout out to the Yam Fam. In addition to that, I want to say hello to everybody joining us from one of our watch parties. This is the first Sunday that we're able to meet together in the comfort of your living room. So shout out to you guys. Hi. And uh, we're so thankful. I hope the donuts and coffee and all those things are spectacular. The next thing I want to say is happy Father's Day to all of you uh, who are fathers. I've been a dad for quite some time now. Uh, I became a dad at 22, I believe. Uh, and so it's been some years. I love being a father. Um, at the same time, I, I fully realize that Father's Day is not the best day for everybody, that there's, there's hurts and, and pains of abuse, that, that there's troubles that have come through loss and death. Um, well, at the same time, those of us who are able to celebrate, I, I celebrate with you as well. Along the same vein of fathers, I want to give a shout out to Brian Wurzel. His first year as a dad, Brian, uh, I think I speak for all of us when I say Rookie of the Year Award goes to you, my friend. Uh, you and Promise and Quest, such a beautiful little family, such an awesome chubby little baby boy. So congrats to you, Rookie of the Year. But if you're the Rookie of the Year, then that makes me the MVP. As I was studying for today's sermon, which we'll get to in just a second, my youngest son, Max, drew this picture on his own that says number one dad, and it has a note on the back that says, I love you so much. So I don't care what all you guys got. I got a handwritten piece of art that I didn't even ask for that a teacher didn't commission from my son as I was studying for this sermon. So I'll take that as a gift. Now, you're probably wondering what we're doing here. This doesn't look like the normal hillside uh, stage, does it? Well, I'm so glad you've asked. Why don't you take out your Bibles and turn to Psalm 19. As you do so, I'll pray, and this whole thing will make sense as we unpack this passage together. So let me pray over our time together. As I do, turn on, open whatever you do for your Bible, and, uh, and I'll meet you in Psalm 19. But let's pray first. God, we love you. We thank you for Father's Day. God, I pray now, as we open up your word, that you would teach us. That your spirit would, would reveal to us and teach us truths about you today that would transform our lives. God, this message is not just aimed towards fathers. It's aimed to all of us. And so, God, would you teach us now as we open your word together, would you speak? We love you so much. It's in your great name we pray. Amen. So Psalm 19, that's where we're hanging out. Psalm 19, verse 1. It says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words till the ends of the earth. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. Have you heard this passage before? I've heard it many times. I've heard this passage a ton. The heavens declare the glory of God. For many years I worked at a camp and the surroundings of that camp looked very much like this. So it was, it was almost a hi, how's your day going? The heavens declare the glory of God almost became a salutation of, of sorts as, as we would converse with each other. But have you ever dove into the meaning behind what this passage is really saying? I haven't. And as we talked through as a, as a teaching team Father's Day and began to think and pray through what God would have us uh, teach on today, I had this picture of trees and green in my head, followed shortly after by Psalm 19. And as I began to dive into this psalm, one that I've heard a bunch of but didn't know much about apart from what's on the surface, I realized that this is the perfect setting and the perfect passage for Father's Day. What do I mean by that? Check this out. Verse 1, the heavens declare. The Hebrew understanding of the words heaven and declare are simple yet profound. The concept of heavens means quite literally spoken creation. Spoken creation. The starry, the starry hosts at night specifically. The galaxy that is above us. The space that we can see when the earth's lights go off and we have a clear view of the night sky. That word declare means to proclaim, or in other contexts, to preach. So David starts this psalm out by quite literally saying that the stars are preaching a sermon. They're proclaiming, or yelling, or screaming something to us. 
Well, what exactly are the heavens declaring to us? If you read on in verse 1, it says that the heavens declare the glory of God. That, that, that what the universe, the things that God has created are, are preaching, are speaking, are yelling to those of us who live here on earth is that God has glory. The heavens declare the glory of God. That's fascinating, isn't it? But, but what does this word glory mean? I mean, if there's a cosmic sermon being played at all times, I want to know what that's about. I want to be able to turn my ear and specifically my heart to what that message could potentially be. The Hebrew word for glory is this understanding of beauty that exudes from good character. So when you string these words together, the heavens, the stars, the sky, creation, declares, is preaching that God is of good character or that he's glorious. That God is of good character. Like I said, I've, I've read and understood this passage many times, but, but never in this way until I began to study it. Now, for those of you who have got to meet in person, you know this about me. I am six foot five, about 300 pounds. So I am what some would call a giant, okay? Maybe don't call me that. It might hurt my feelings, but I can call me that. I'm a giant. What I love is that family functions, gatherings, Christmas parties, whatever, when I interact with old family, fa- family friends, they all say the same thing to me. Man, you remind me so much of your dad. You remind me so much of your father. And it's never really made sense to me. And so finally I stopped and I asked someone, what do you mean by that? Here's what you need to know about my dad if you haven't met him yet. My dad is like five foot nine. He'll tell you he's 5'10", maybe 5'11". That guy's 5'9", and he's like a buck 80. My dad is not a big guy. And then there's me. I eat people like him. I'm that big, right? Like, that's who I am. But it wasn't until I stopped and asked somebody, what do you mean by that, that I understood what they were saying. They said, no, no, no. You act just like him. Your sense of humor, your quick wit, your dashing good looks reminds us so much of your father. It's almost as though David is saying this same thing to us. That when we look up at the sky, it's, it's a resemblance of the person who created it. It's as though we get to interact with the thumbprint or the identification of God. And that identification is reminding us that God is of good character. It's also important for us to note as we talk about created things that you and I fall into that category. Although the way we were created, God took intention and care as we see in Genesis 1 was different, we still bear the image of who God is. You and I as well proclaim the glory of God, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. I remember in elementary school, I learned of a scientist named George Washington Carver. Now, you might remember George Washington Carver. He was a famous inventor. He was a a famous scientist. He worked at the, uh, the Tuskegee University, I believe it was. And what he did was he found hundreds of uses for the peanut plant. He found ways to make fuel out of it, so on and so forth. He was also a believer. And so being a horticulturist and a scientist and inventor with the lens of someone who understands who God is, listen to this fascinating quote that he said. He said, I love to think of nature as an unlimited broadcasting station through which God speaks to us every hour if we will only tune in. It's almost like flipping on the radio. The modern day context would be, it's almost like turning on Netflix and starting a new series But the constant message that's on an infinite replay feedback loop is that God is glorious. That God speaks to us through nature. That God speaks to us through creation. And the sermon that is being spoken through the things God has made is that he is good. That his nature is good. That his character is good. So the question I have for us is this. Are you, like David tuning in to what God's creation is saying to us. It's almost like I get this picture in my head of David, the former shepherd who would chase sheep all across the Judean countryside, is now a king in a palace. From the pasture to the palace, now David still has a familiar view above him as he looks up to the starry sky at night. And that view reminds him of this simple truth that God 
is glorious, that he's good. Let's continue on in Psalm 19. He says this about creation. He says, It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at the end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect and refreshing to the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey straight from the honeycomb. He uses this law and prophet language in the same way that you and I would use the language of Scripture today. He's saying the recorded laws of God are good. They're more pure than gold. They're more pure than honey. And they're telling us also a message in the same way that the heavens are. You could almost think of it this way. Creation speaks of God in general terms, while Scripture speaks with specificity to who He is. What that means is this that the message that the heavens are declaring is exactly in line with the message of who God is that scripture speaks to us. But now look at how he ends this psalm because it gets so much deeper for us. He says, but who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. He goes on to talk about what you and I would call sin or transgressions. So in light of the glory and nature and perfect character that is God Almighty, the powerful God who has the ability to speak things into existence and at the same time form humankind in his own image out of the dust of the earth, he says compared to him, we don't measure up. I may be like him, resembling him in my nature, but my sin nature couldn't be further from who he is. The Bible talks about this in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. I would love for you to turn there with me right now. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, Ephesians is a fascinating letter, and chapter 2 specifically is one that I have spent a lot of my life memorizing because there's such deep truths and gospel tie-ins in chapter 2 specifically. But again, in order for us to understand the glory and the fullness of who God is, we need to understand who we are in light of that. And I really think that's why David goes into that, keep me from my transgressions language. It says this in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, he says, as for you, that's us, we were dead in our transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. He says, all of us also, that's we language, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Paul paints a picture as he unpacks the concept of sin in Ephesians chapter 2 by saying it this way, you and I were once children of sinfulness. That you and I, that you and I once, before we came into a relationship with God, used to have a father who was sin. But then there's this profound statement, and we see it around a hundred times in scripture that happens right at verse four. And it's this language, but God. All throughout the Bible, when we see this but God language, you have to understand that the trajectory of where the passage was going and where it ends are drastically different. Look at what he says in, in Ephesians chapter four. He says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive together with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions, for it is by grace that you have been saved. He takes us on a journey here. He says that you were once sinful, 
separated from God. Uh, the book of Romans would teach that the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23, the but God statement there, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know about you, but people who give out free gifts are typically people who have good character. Generous people have good character. Let's put Jesus into that equation. If the heavens are declaring the glory of God, and that glory comes from the goodness of God's character, then this good God has freely given us the gift of grace through his son Jesus. The fullness, the full weight of God's glory, the Bible teaches, was pleased to dwell in Colossians 1.19, was pleased to dwell in the person of Jesus. The fullness of God's glory, that same God, God's glory in, in Psalm 19 that David is observing, was pleased to dwell in Jesus. And like Ephesians tells us, the but God statement here that is so profound is that God has freely offered this gift of love and relationship to anyone who desires to have it. Think about that for a second. Now think about the fullness of God's glory being pleased to dwell in Jesus is the same glory, the same message that the earth has been proclaiming to us from the beginning of time. What that means for us is this, when we step outside and get a chance to observe the beauty of the world around us, it should serve as a reminder that God is the greatest father the universe has ever known. During this time of sheltering in place, of quarantine, uh, I, I've really enjoyed getting outside and taking walks or taking a bike ride, probably much like many of you. I was on one of these bike rides once, and I ran into a dear friend of mine. Uh, she attends our young adults gatherings on Monday nights. Her name is Jada. And the reason I knew it was Jada is because when I saw this person, they were rollerblading. And rollerblades hadn't become as popular when I saw her as they are now. And I rolled up to her, and I said, hey, what are you doing? And she's just looking around, and she's going, I am just out here enjoying and observing God's creation. And I thought, how amazing is that? except we're on the Pacific Electric Trail, which if you're not familiar with the area where our physical building is located in Rancho Cucamonga, there's this trail that goes through each of the surrounding cities, almost cuts our city through the heart, and it's used for exercise, walking, biking, whatever else, right? She's out there, and, and the reason I share that is because this trail goes through a lot of residential areas and streets. It's, it's not necessarily known for its beauty per se. But as I was talking with her, I realized that she's observing things that can only be observed by someone who's looking for them. That, that when we've been confined to our 12 by 12 walls, staying inside, staying safe, we can lose sight of who we are in light of who God is. Again, stepping outside can serve a rem as a reminder of the love that God has for us. And so I began to pepper her with questions. Well, what do you see? Look at these plants. They're beautiful. And there's animals. And look at the mountains. And, and I love nature. I connect well with God outside. I, I might leave. I might stay here when this is over and just live here. I think I could do it. So she's talking about animals. And I look at her and go, well, what animals? And she's like, well, every now and then I see squirrels. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool and dogs. And I'm like, yeah, squirrels and dogs. We do have animals here. This is great. But she was picking up on something that I wasn't. And it's that being outside connects us with God in ways that being indoors just simply can't. Maybe looking at pictures can or watching videos can, but there's nothing that replaces getting outside. And when we step outside with this reminder at the forefront of our minds that God loves us, that he's for us, and that his glory has been on display, preaching the same message from the beginning of creation, that God is good, that he loves us, and that the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus Christ. The reminder for you and I today is simple but strong. God is the greatest father the universe has ever known. That, that if, if you had a really good father growing up, or you had a terrible father growing up, or maybe somewhere in between, no matter what example of an earthly father you have, this reminder for us today that God is good, that he loves us, that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. But Jesus didn't stay dead. 
The Bible teaches that three days later, he rose again, showing that he has power over dead things, that he has the ability to make dead things come alive again. And that through his sacrifice, through his sacrificial love, you and I have the opportunity to be made alive together with Christ, like Ephesians says. That's profound and deep stuff. And that has to shape the way that we think of days like Father's Day. Days like Father's Day can serve as worshipful reminders that God loves us and is for us. I'd love to to share this quote with you, and then we'll close our time together. Max Lucado says this, You weren't an accident. You weren't mass produced. You are not an assembly line product. You were deliberately planned, specifically gifted, and lovingly positioned on earth by the master craftsman. Church family, you have value and importance. God desires for you to be here today. And he also desires for us to experience his love. He desires for us to grow in community. That is the family of believers. And he desires for us to serve the world with compassion as a result of who he is. Did you know that? Because when we think of ourselves as worthy, valuable things that were made in the image of a glorious God who is of good character, it has to change the way we live. Our worlds have to look different as a result of it. So I'll say it one last time. Stepping outside can serve as a reminder that God is the greatest father that the universe has ever known. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for this reminder out of Psalm 19. I just love the way that this psalm ends. As David says at the very end of Psalm 19, Would the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O God? Would we meditate on these truths? Would we allow our words to stem from this one simple truth? Would those of us who are fathers be challenged to love and raise and disciple our children in light of your glory? And would those of us who aren't fathers, would those of us who who call you our heavenly father, who, who are followers, who are believers, God, would we also submit ourselves to the fact that we can be people who proclaim the glory of who you are, that we can be people who can live in such a way that the glory of who you are can be on display through our lives. God, we love you and we thank you for this wonderful day. It's in your name we pray. Amen.